Now, in chapter 53 of Isaiah, I've divided it like this. The first nine verses, the suffering of the Savior, and verses 10 through 12, the satisfaction of the Savior. And I have a message on this, and that message I'll bring next time, but the title of it is A Photograph of the Cross. But let's look here at this wonderful picture that we have of the cross in Isaiah 53. Now, those that are acquainted with God's Word, they realize that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and the 22nd Psalm give us a more vivid account of the crucifixion of Christ than is found anywhere else in the Bible. Now, this may shock some of you, because we are accustomed to think that the four Gospels alone describe the sad episode of the horrible death of the Son of God. Now, if you'll examine carefully the Gospel accounts, you will make the discovery that only a few unrelated events that are connected with the crucifixion are given, and that the actual crucifixion is passed over with a reverent restraint. The Holy Spirit has drawn the veil of silence over that cross, and none of the lurid details are set forth for the curious mob to gaze and leer upon. It is said of the brutal crowd who murdered him that they sat down and watched him. You and I are not permitted to join that crowd. Even they did not see all, for God placed over his son's agony mantle of the darkness." And some sensational speakers, they gather to themselves a bit of notoriety by painting with picturesque speech the minutest details of what they think took place at the crucifixion of Christ. Art has given us the account of his death in ghastly reality. You and I will probably never know, even in eternity, the extent of his suffering. None of the ransom ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Now, as we enter this chapter, Isaiah, 700 years before Christ was born, he lets us see something of the suffering of Christ that we'll not find anywhere else. Before going any further, probably we must pause a moment to answer the question that someone, even now, is doubtless asking. How do you know that Isaiah is referring to the death of Christ? Isaiah wrote, as you've indicated, 700 years before Christ was born. How can you be sure? Well, That's the question that the Ethiopian eunuch raised when Philip hitchhiked a ride from him out in the desert when the Ethiopian eunuch was returning from Jerusalem back to his own country. And he was reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah as he was sitting in his chariot. And the little picture I was given as a boy in Sunday school, it showed this Ethiopian eunuch holding the lines with one hand, the horses hitched to the chariot, and he's reading a book with the other hand. Well, I want to tell you that's not the way it happened. This man was an official of the government of Ethiopia, and he was going across that desert in style. I'm sure that he was under some sort of a shade and sitting there reading, and he had a chauffeur who was doing the driving for him. The thing is, this idea of him holding on to the reins and reading, that might apply to a Los Angeles driver, but not to the Ethiopian eunuch of that day. Well, this was the question that he asked of Philip. He says, who is the prophet talking about? Is he speaking of himself or some other one? And now I read the quotation from the book of Acts, We are told, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
Now, the Lord Jesus Christ in John, the 12th chapter, verse 38, he quoted from Isaiah 53, and he made application to himself. And Paul in Romans 10, 16, quotes from this same chapter in connection with the gospel of Christ. Now, without attempting at all to enlarge upon these references, we want to affirm that Isaiah 53 refers to Christ. And even more than that, it is a photograph of the cross of Christ as he was dying there. Now, this chapter, as we've indicated before, tells us two things about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in the first nine verses the suffering of Christ or the suffering of the Savior. And in verses 10 through 12, we have the satisfaction of the Savior. Now, you will find that these two belong together, suffering and satisfaction. Suffering always precedes satisfaction. Too many folk today are trying to take a shortcut to happiness by attempting to avoid all the trying experiences of life. And I'm here to tell you today there's no short route to satisfaction. And that's the reason that I condemn with no unmistakable terms the fact that a great many people think if you go take a little course of a week or of a few weeks, go once a week for several months, that somehow or another it gives you the answer to all the problems of life and that you are well equipped then armed with the armor of God. Well, may I say to you, that's not the way God does it. And there's no short route. Even God did not go the short route. He could have avoided the cross and accepted the crown. That was Satan's suggestion, you remember. But suffering comes before satisfaction always. And the phraseology bears various expressions, for instance, like this, through trial to triumph. Sunshine comes after the clouds. Light follows darkness, and flowers come after the rain clouds. Now, that seems to be God's way of doing things. And since it's His method, then it's the very best way. Perhaps today you are sitting in the shadows of life, Trials confront you. Problems overwhelm you. The fiery furnace is your present lot. And you've tasted the bitter without the sweet. And if that's your case right now, then let me encourage your heart and fortify your faith for saying that you're on the same pathway that God followed and that it leads at last to light if you walk with him. For weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. 